Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Burundians vote in tense elections. Opposition supporters say that they've faced intimidation and arbitrary arrests during polling to find a replacement for President Pierre Kurenziza. Also, Beijing's medical help to Zimbabwe as the African nation works to stem the spread of coronavirus is likely to deepen China's economic influence in the country. And as most South Africans remain at home under tough lockdown orders, children from vulnerable families are missing out on schooling and finding it hard to keep up. We hear from one project that's using storytelling to keep young minds learning wherever they may be. But first, in Burundi, opposition politicians are claiming that their supporters were intimidated during Wednesday's election. Voters are choosing a replacement for President Pierre Kurunziza five years after the country was plunged into violent political unrest over his eventually successful bid for a controversial third term in office. Since then, state forces have been accused of numerous human rights abuses. Laurent Berstecker has more. Surrounded by his family and supporters, Evariste Ndashimier arrived in the ruling party stronghold of Gitega to cast his vote. The designated successor of President Pierre Nkurunziza called on all Burundians to respect the outcome of the elections. Further north, in Ngozi province, opposition candidate Agaton Rwasa also cast his ballot in the early hours on Wednesday. Widely considered the main challenger after mobilizing massive support during his campaign, the CNL party candidate had to convince local organizers to let him vote in front of the cameras. Agaton Rwasa, who has repeatedly denounced harassment and intimidation attempts against his supporters, again accused authorities of interfering with the vote. On voit des actes de, 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 de chasse à l'homme. On a arrêté des centaines et des centaines de nos mandataires pour qu'on n'ait pas de mandataires dans les bureaux de vote. It's the first time in 15 years that Burundi holds an election without Pierre Nkurunziza's name on the ballot. But while the outgoing president has agreed to step down, he intends to stay involved in politics and will continue to occupy a position of influence within his party. Lesotho's former finance minister has been sworn in as prime minister. Moyeketsi Majoro took over a day after Thomas Tabane resigned amidst accusations of having played a part in the murder of his ex-wife. Lipolelo Tabane was shot dead in 2017, whilst the couple were in the midst of a bitter divorce. Thomas Tabani's current spouse, Maisaya, has been charged with murder and is out on bail. He denies involvement in the assassination. Majora will serve out the rest of his predecessor's term until elections are next held in 2022. And the UN chief has held up Africa as an example in taking measures to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the world's top economies could learn from the efforts of nations on the continent to move swiftly to bring in wide-ranging policies, including strict lockdowns, to stem the rate of coronavirus infections. Africa has seen fewer than 3,000 deaths from COVID-19 and around 88,000 confirmed cases of the disease. Globally, there have been over 320,000 deaths. As COVID-19 spreads across the continent, Africa has responded swiftly to the pandemic, and as of now, reported cases are lower than feared. Most have moved rapidly to deepen regional coordination, deploy health workers and enforce quarantines, lockdowns and border closures. Zimbabwe has received help from China in its fight against COVID-19. The two nations have strong historical ties and the medical aid is likely to deepen Beijing's influence in the country. Our correspondents have more. China is one of Zimbabwe's biggest trade partners. Medical aid is its latest export. Since the start of the outbreak, China has invested millions of dollars to help the Zimbabwean health system and donated close to 200,000 masks and 20,000 test kits. And now, tens of Chinese physicians have arrived, bringing with them a consignment of ventilators, testing kits and PPE. Some have described this as coronavirus diplomacy. This is a very good reflection of the rock salt friendship between China and Zimbabwe. 
At the Marondera General Hospital, 75 kilometers east of Harare, the Chinese team leads a workshop on how to contain COVID-19. Among them are epidemiologists, respiratory experts and practitioners of traditional medicine. Having battled the virus at home, the Chinese medics are well placed to share their expertise. They told France 24 that they were impressed by the Zimbabwean government's preventative measures. The government is, for example, building this COVID-19 isolation centre next to Marandera Hospital. China has pledged $2 billion over the next two years to help developing countries with coronavirus response. With Zimbabwe's health system undersupplied, the financing cannot come soon enough. What we basically need is are the, uh, the resources such as personal protective equipment and the labo to increase the laboratory cat capacity, we need more test kits. Zimbabwe's economy is set to deteriorate even further because of COVID-19. Medical aid could be a tool for Beijing to leverage greater influence in the country. To South Africa now, where tough lockdown restrictions were brought in in March. The country has been hardest hit by the virus on the continent, but measures are due to be eased from June. Most of the country is under phase four of the lockdown. Some key sectors have gone back to work, but most South Africans are still at home. And schools are due to remain closed until June 1st. The two-month shutdown has been hardest on poorer communities and their children are particularly vulnerable. One project to help kids keep learning, even while stuck at home, has called on the storytelling magic of household name Klina Makopi. Take a listen. One morning, Mazanendaba woke up and went out into the wild to meet animals or birds or reptiles, anybody who might know some stories. First she met the spring hare, Unogwaja. Oh, I know lots of stories. In fact, um, I could tell you a story about, um, um, I'm in such a hurry. Next time I see you, I'll tell you. <laughs> Liar. He didn't know any stories. Well, that was just a little taste of a podcast, which are part, some, part of something called Lockdown Stories. And they're aimed at keeping children from lower socioeconomic areas educationally entertained. One of the organisers of the project is Professor Magnet Tumbela from Mancosa. Because of coronavirus, uh, schools were closed and parents were working from home or were on, on forced leave. It, it became hectic. It became very difficult for poor families. Uh, as you will know that uh, South Africa is a, a very unequal society. Whilst in some other more affluent schools, uh, kids were given uh, work to do at home and so on. But poorer kids were kept at home. And if you have parents who are busy trying to uh, adapt to actually working at home, and you have kids who get easily bored so we thought of this project, and uh, Trina was available to select 10 of her stories to keep our, our kids uh, edutained, I mean, uh, entertained and educated, and having their, their, their brains actually uh, working whilst they were at home. So, so, I mean, stories are obviously very exciting. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Professor, but I mean, it's great that children okay. have access to stories. They're stimulating, they're entertaining. But how can how are they educational? How can they help work to to help bridge the gap for children from poorer families who are missing school because of lockdown? OK, uh, children from poor families usually don't have books in their homes. But storytelling is, is, is just embedded in the African culture. Even parents who didn't go to school can tell stories, can remember stories that they were told by their, their parents and their grandparents. So if you use that vehicle that is uh, actually a bond, it, it can actually tie down the interests of the, of, the, of the children as well as of uh, parents. So with her with her passion, and uh, her unique voice, I mean, uh, her stories are just amazing. They, they actually help the kids' uh, imagination. They help kids in their development of a vocabulary. And some of the concepts, I mean, parents have been giving us feedback, saying that uh, some of the terms 
were actually learned like radius in some of the stories and some of the values, very important values are learned in these stories. Feedback that we've been getting is that uh, these stories are good for everyone and they actually bring families uh, together and uh, some, some uh, parents, even if they never went to school themselves, can actually uh, test the kids' uh, comprehension by saying, okay, please tell uh, the story again. What did you understand? What are some of the, the particular educational challenges faced by poorer families in lockdown? Unlike uh, 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 better resource schools who, who can actually keep in contact with their uh, children uh, online, most of these kids are in, 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 uh, in areas where there's no internet uh, connectivity. They themselves don't have all of those gadgets like tablets and, and uh, laptops. And, and uh, school plays a very important part in South Africa in that for poorer families, it's even a place where they get one meal a day or they are guaranteed one meal a day. So in a poor family where there's uh, mental anxiety, where there's uh, anxiety of parents and, and there they might be also violence and so on, it, it becomes a very sad uh, circumstance where education cannot take place. But with, the, with storytelling, it's just like a glue that brings everybody together. Everybody gets excited. They follow the stories. And uh, unfortunately, we could only tell, I mean, uh, uh, give uh, these stories for 10 days. And uh, after, after the last story, we were getting uh, messages, uh, when are you starting again? Uh, because the experience has been of so much value. Thank you very much, Professor Magnate Dombella. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for for now. Uh, do join us again if you can. Take care. More coming up after a short break.